Welcome to the official Heisman Trophy Podcast. Hello, Chuck Conrad with a kickoff. Roy has a strong leg, end over end. Sanders takes it one yard deep to the end zone. Up the middle, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. He's at the 40, he's at the 45, 50, 45, 40, 45, 30, 45, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, Welcome to the official Heisman Trophy podcast. I'm your host, Chris Houston. If you love college football and the Heisman Trophy, then you have come to the right place. All we do is feature some of the best players in college football, some of the brightest minds who cover college football, and we talk to some of the legends of the sport. We talk about what makes the trophy great, what makes college football great, and provide insight into what's going on right now. So we appreciate you listening. We hope you like, subscribe, follow, give us a good review along the way. Follow us this whole season and we're going to give you the ins and outs of what's going on with the Heisman race and college football. We've got a very exciting show for you this week. We've got Mississippi quarterback Jackson Dart to kick things off. And then we'll talk to Missouri wide receiver Luther Burden, one of the great receivers in the country. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what September means for the Heisman Trophy. First, a little bit of Heisman-related news. Week one of the NFL season kicked off last weekend, and two Heisman rookies made their regular season debuts. Both Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels were a bit rough around the edges at times, and we know it ain't easy being a rookie, but they acquitted themselves well overall. Williams was just 14 of 29 for 93 yards, but Chicago did come away with a victory over Tennessee. Daniels was sharper, completing 17 of 24 for 184 yards, and he also rushed for 88 yards and two scores, but Washington lost to Tampa Bay. It's going to take time for these two to get acclimated to the NFL, but you can see they are already flashing their raw talents. Mark your calendar for October 27th when the two Heisman winners face off for the first time. Out West, USC has a couple new retired jerseys. The Trojans recently placed Williams as number 13 and Reggie Bush as number 5 in the Coliseum's Peristyle end, joining USC's six other Heisman winners in a place of honor. Speaking of honors, 1999 Heisman winner Ron Dane is of course celebrating the 25th anniversary of his Heisman Trophy winning season this year, and the University of Wisconsin is honoring their running back legend on Saturday, September 14th during the Badgers game against Alabama. Dane, as you Heisman aficionados will recall, broke the NCAA Division I career rushing record during his amazing 1999 season. One more note before we get to Jackson Dart. Williams and Daniels, of course, were the latest quarterbacks to win the Heisman. That makes seven of the last eight and 12 of the last 14 Heismans won by quarterbacks. It stands to reason that quarterbacks have a positional advantage when it comes to the Heisman race. Voters make their choices based on statistical metrics, and no position in the sport has more metrics applied to it than the quarterback spot. In general, the more information that is available to help quantify a player's impact, the more likely it is it will affect his position both positively and negatively in the Heisman race. But with all the talk of quarterbacks, it seems like this year, running backs are starting to creep back into the conversation. Last week's Heisman Trophy podcast featured Boise State running back Ashton Genty, who's off to the best start of any running back in quite a while. Through two games, he already has 459 yards and nine touchdowns, which makes him the first player since Ricky Williams, Heisman Trophy winner from 1998, to score that many touchdowns in his first two games of the season. And if you're keeping pace with Ricky Williams, you are doing a really good job as a running back. A couple other running backs are also off to great starts and have already ripped off 200-yard games, including Kyle Manangai of Rutgers and Cam Scadabo of Arizona State. So with the caveat that it's still very early in the season, we are starting to see some very high rushing averages among the nation's running backs. For comparison's sake, last year's NCAA rushing leader Cody Schrader of Missouri averaged just 125 yards per game. So the question I present to you, dear listener, is are running backs back? Stay tuned. This past Monday, we learned that the great James Earl Jones passed away at the age of 93. Ray, people will come, Ray. They'll come to Iowa for reasons they can't even fathom. I always considered his voice the Heisman Trophy of baritones, if you will. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Rest in peace, Lord Vader. Like so many other elite players in today's college football world, Jackson Dart's career has spanned a couple teams. He started out at USC, and as a true freshman, acquitted himself quite well. He threw for 391 yards in his first start. This was actually a USC record. But early in his freshman season, his coach Clay Helton was fired, and once Lincoln Riley was hired and he brought with him Caleb Williams, 
it became clear to Jackson Dart that he needed to find another place to play. Enter Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin, and the rest is history. Now a senior and a multi-year starter for the Rebels, he has thrown for 8,486 yards and 58 touchdowns in his career, and he's off to a hot start in 2024 with 795 yards passing, six touchdowns. He's also scored two touchdowns with his feet, and with all that he has going for him, he is considered one of the prime Heisman Trophy candidates this season. And we were able to catch up with him on Tuesday, so let's hear what he has to say. Okay, Jackson Dart, the Rebels are 2-0 and ranked 5th in the country, and you're off to a hot start leading the nation in all kinds of passing categories. But you're now your first road trip is coming up. So what has the coaching staff been emphasizing to the team as you prepare for Wake Forest? I think the biggest thing that Coach Kiff always preaches is, you know, pack your run game and, and pack your defense on the road. So, um, you know, this team, we've never, we haven't, like you said, we haven't been on a road trip. So it's going to be really fun to kind of experience that with those guys and, um, you know, play a really good team that we're excited to play this week. And, uh, you know, excited to elevate our game and, and to play on a really high level. What do you think will be the biggest challenge for the offense going against the Demon Deacons? Yeah, they're a very sound defense all across the board from the defensive line to the de- defensive backfield. Um, they have a lot of experienced guys, guys who have played a lot of football. So um, I think from just that standpoint, you know, you're not gonna really going to beat them at the fundamentals. So um, we got to find ways to find advantages um, and hopefully just, you know, win as many one-on-one uh, opportunities that we get. And then at the same time, like I said earlier, try to just establish the run game and, um, you know, control the line of scrimmage as much as we can. Uh, you know, they're going to come out firing. They got a good offense. So uh, we got to do all that we can to, to, to match that and, uh, you know, really just control the line of scrimmage. Now, last Saturday, you completed your first 24 passes to set a program record and you were two off of the NCAA record and you completed the final six passes of week one. So that's a streak of 30 straight completions the SEC's longest completion streak ever over two games. What is it like to go on a streak like that? You know, do you ever, did you ever do that in your life? Like even with your dad in the backyard as a kid? <laughs> I'm not sure if I have, honestly. Uh, it was a fun feeling to be in. You know, people talk about just like being in the zone and kind of just finding a rhythm in the game. Um, I feel like the game slowed down a lot for me and was able to just find a lot of consistency. And I think honestly, it was a little contagious for our unit as an offense and guys were able to make plays for me. I think that, you know, I give all the credit to them and my coaches for putting us in the best situations to, to execute. And uh, it was just a lot of fun to, to be out there with the guys and, and to play at, at that level. And, um, you know, hopefully I can just find ways to continue to do that. Yeah. You know, how do they treat you in the sidelines when you're coming off and uh, when you're on that kind of role? Is it like a pitcher during a no hitter? Like, are you aware of, of your streak and no one wants to talk to you about it? Yeah, it's funny, you know, because after the game, people started bringing it up to me. Nobody said anything to me during the game. Um, yeah. Like you said, people definitely compared it to like a pitcher. Um, but, you know, I saw, it, uh, you know, on the screen when the stats popped up a few times and it's kind of like, dang, you know, I'm in a good spot right now. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. Tell me about this bond that you have with wide receiver Trey Harris. It seems like you guys really feed off each other, both as competitors and as teammates. Yeah, you know, not only is he probably my best friend on the team, but I think he's the best receiver in the country. And, you know, I think that all goes to credit with how much time that, you know, we've spent with each other doing extra work or, you know, just hanging out and, you know, finding that bond between one another. Uh, You know, I feel like I always know where he's at on the field and any time that he has an opportunity to have a one-on-one matchup or to go get a ball. I have all the confidence in the world that he's going to make that play. And he works his tail off, you know, all throughout the off season and into camp. So, you know, I thought that he was well prepared going into this year and was really excited for him to show the whole world kind of what level he was going to play at. Yeah. One of the things I like about your game is your hard nosed approach to doing your job. You're not afraid of contact. You're not afraid to hurdle defenders. Where did this attitude come from? Because not a lot of quarterbacks have it. Yeah. I think, from, you know, early on, uh, my dad played safety at the University of Utah and he kind of raised me to kind of follow in his footsteps uh, per se. So, you know, growing up, I always played both sides and I love defense and I love the physicality of the sport. It was something I was really drawn to. And um, I think anytime that, you know, your teammates can see, you know, playing at that level of just, you know, competitiveness and then, you know, putting your all on the line for them, I think it forms like a, a little bit of an edge for your team. Um, so I think that that's kind of where it all started from. And, uh, it's just really something I love about the sport. Your mom's probably not too fond of you, uh, not sliding in those situations, right? Yeah. She makes sure to remind me every time on the walk of champions or you know, on away games and pregame to always slide. You had a nice season last year, led Mississippi to its first ever 11 win season. 
How close were you last December to making a jump to the NFL? Yeah, quite honestly, it was close. Um, I'm just really thankful for the the close circle that I have and just the mentors that I had being able to help me make a decision like that. I think ultimately it just came down to the momentum of this program and where we're at. And then at the same time, just the conversations that I was having with my teammates who were kind of on the bubble as well. And, uh, you know, we saw the opportunity that we have for this year with everybody coming back. I was just really excited about the opportunity and we want to do something that's never been done here before. So you chose to come back for another season and, you know, there's been so many changes since you were a freshman. What's it like being a college football player now as opposed to when you first entered college back at SC? Um, yeah, I, there's definitely a little bit of a difference, but, you know, honestly, I, I see it as the same thing. Uh, I just have always prioritized football and ball is ball and just keeping the main thing the main thing. Um, so, you know, from my perspective of going to work every single day or just my approach and mindset, nothing has changed from that standpoint. Um, but I think it's just been great, you know, being able to play with new players from the transfer portal and, um, being able to bring guys in from all across the country and ultimately just make the best team possible. Well, speaking of that, I hear you played a big part in getting lots of fresh talent to Ole Miss. Tell me about some of the things you did to help convince some guys to come. Uh, I think the biggest thing was just trying to make genuine relationships with those guys and just being upfront and honest. Uh, I feel like, you know, in recruiting nowadays, um, there's a lot of things that are kind of shaded and there's not as much honesty involved. So uh, I just wanted to be authentic and wanted to make sure that those guys saw what this program was about, Um, you know, not behind closed doors, just straight up what it was. And uh, Mm -hmm. that played a major role of being able to make those relationships and ultimately just gain trust and, uh, you know, I think at the same time, there's this this program sells itself. There's a lot of energy around it. The coaching staff is elite, and uh, you know ultimately, I think that that was the biggest thing involved. Um, you know, with those guys making decisions. What do you like the most about living in Oxford, and what do you miss the most from the West Coast? The biggest thing that I miss from the West Coast is probably just my family. Uh, you know, it's, it's a far ways away. I miss the mountains and, and the lakes for sure. Uh, but I love Oxford. I love the people here. I love the support system and, um, just the energy surrounding, you know, football in the South is, it, it, you can't compare it. So I think from that standpoint, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I love how I'm able to just really just lock in and hone in on, you know, my craft of football and I don't really have too many distractions around me. And, uh, I, I love that about it. And, uh, like I said, I love the people and, and, yeah. and the community as a whole. I hear you're quite the hunter and that you are into, Going after exotic animals. I am. I am. How did you get your start doing that? Yeah, my dad is an avid hunter and outdoorsman. Um, so I've been surrounded by it my whole entire life. I mean, since I could remember, my dad was, you know, making me hike up mountains with him and, and go on hunts. So uh, it was something I was drawn to as, as an early age. And, uh, you know, it's kind of just strengthened, you know, my, uh, my love for it. Um, coming to the South and being surrounded by it. You know, I've really loved, you know, getting into, into ducks and, and, and stuff out here. So it's a lot of fun. I love being outdoors. I love being in, away from social media, away from, you know, distractions and really just finding myself in the moment and in that piece. What's some of the most interesting animals you've been able to, to hunt? Jeez. Um, black bear is super fun. Um, mountain lion are cool. Um, uh, you know, I love hunting just mule deer and, and elk, uh, but honestly, I feel like if in in the states wise, if if you can name it, I've you know I've been on a hunt for. <laughs> Do you make venison or like, uh, you know, um, uh, beef jerky or anything like that out of, out of your your kills? Everything, yeah, <laughs> everything. Yes, sir. Now you were recently featured in GQ magazine on account of you're a pretty stylish gent. The word on the street is that you plan your outfits well in advance. So what I want to know is if you tend to abide by typical fashion rules. Uh, I kind of just abide by you know whatever I'm feeling at that moment. Um, I like to kind of be disruptive, um, and really just, you know, show who I am, um, you know, deep down in my fashion. I think my, my mom does a great job of helping me and, uh, she definitely plays a huge role in helping me to prepare for those fits throughout the season. Are you big into accessories? I am. I am. I am. (laughs) Outside of Ole Miss swag, what's your go-to fit when you're going out in Oxford? Well, geez, I feel like I dress differently uh, than everybody else in Oxford. You know, you see the khaki pants and and the button ups and whatnot, you know, and then you see me with, you know, cargos and whatnot. So, uh, you know, I kind of, you know, I I like to dress the way that I dress. Uh, I mean, even though it's a little different than others, but I have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. 
when you recruited out of high school, you signed with USC in the same class as its current quarterback, Miller Moss. Right now, between the two of you, you've got 1,400 passing yards, eight touchdowns, no interceptions. That's a pretty darn good quarterback recruiting class. Do you and Miller and some of your old teammates all keep up with each other? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would say some of my best friends are still at USC, and I loved my time there. Um, you know, love being in the same quarterback room with Miller. He's, he's a stud, and uh, you know, me and him have a great relationship, so it's fun to follow him and you know, we always have stayed in touch and we also have the same quarterback trainer. So during the off season, we're always together. And, um, you know, at the same time, we're always competing, you know, regardless of if we're in the same room or, you know, across the country. So uh, I'm, I'm always rooting for him. And I think the same goes for him as uh, for me as well. Who's the quarterback trainer you guys train with? Uh, 3D QB. So uh, Adam Dado, Taylor Kelly and John Beck. Is that Adam Dado of, of the USC Dados? Yes, sir. Wow, how about that? Mississippi has had five players in its history finish in the top four of the Heisman race. Most recently, one Eli Manning, who did so in uh, 2003, finished third. You got to work with him at the Manning Passing Academy this summer. What was that like? And did you receive any words of wisdom from him? Yeah, Eli and Archie have been great mentors for me. Um, yeah, I thought it's been super, super unique about how involved they've been um, in my time here. And I thought that you know, their camp was incredible. It was my first year going to it and just experiencing it. Had a ton of fun and was able to learn a lot. Um, but like I said, he's been a huge mentor for me and somebody that I've always really looked up to on the football field. So it's been a neat experience getting to know him and then at the same time him giving me advice going into the season. Do you hear from him more like when you have a rough game or when you have a great game? Probably a great game. Yeah. <laughs> And finally, who are some Heisen winners that you've enjoyed watching over the years? And, and what would it mean for you to take your place with them or at least get to New York City and be a Heisman finalist? Geez, there's been a lot. I mean, I think that, you know, starting out like Marcus Mariota um, was one that I you know loved growing up watching. Uh, Johnny Menzel was super fun. Um, also, guys like Reggie Bush, you know, just growing up watching him as well. Uh, I, I had a u- unique experience of really knowing Jaden closely and He's a dear friend to me and somebody that I've always looked up to. Um, like we also trained with the same quarterback guys. So, um, you know, there's countless guys that I've been able to meet and have encounters with. And I have a ton of respect for them. And like I said, they've been people who I've really looked up to. So it would definitely mean the world. Um, you know, I know that it comes with winning. So right now I'm just focused on winning each and every week and putting my team in the best situation. Well, Jackson Dart of the number five Mississippi Rebels, thanks for coming on the official Heisman Trophy podcast. Good luck against Wake Forest, and we wish you the best of luck this year. Yes, sir. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Hey guys, this is Barry Sanders, the 1988 Heisman Trophy winner, and you are listening to the official Heisman Trophy podcast. The Heisman is handed out every December, but the history of the trophy lives year-round at Heisman.com. Home to the most iconic trophy in sports, Heisman.com tells the stories of all 88 of our winners and features news, bios, and statistics on all your favorite Heisman heroes. Heisman.com also highlights our Heisman humanitarians, the many charities supported by the Heisman Trust, and so much more. Make Heisman.com your first stop for all things Heisman. Luther Burden of the Missouri Tigers, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Your team finished 11-2 and last year, and now you're off to a great start this year. Luther, what is it that makes this Mizzou squad so special, and what do you think it's capable of? Um, I think what makes it so special is um, the brotherhood we got. Um, we know what we all we got, and, you know, we got to lean on each other, you know, when the um, tough moments come, and um, the sky's the limit for this group. You had a huge sophomore season last year, 86 catches, 1,212 yards, nine touchdowns. Established yourself as a premier receiver in college football. What is it about the position that you love the most? Um, I really just love scoring, really. <laughs> um I mean, just scoring and, you know, giving the crowd, you know, a good show. You know, I want them to have a good time when it comes to the game. And, um, you know, just for my uh, teammates, you know, I'm going to do whatever I got to do, you know, to help us win. What is it that separates you from the other elite receivers out there? Uh, I think it's my mentality. Um, 
I feel like my mindset, you know, separates me from um, everybody in the country. Um, just how I think, how I operate, how I go about my things um, will separate mm-hmm. me. Wide receivers have to build a strong connection with their quarterback. Tell me about your relationship with Brady Cook. Uh, me and Brady Cook, uh, we're good friends on and off the field. Um, that's my guy, you know, it's my QB, um, you know, and, and our relationship's great. You got involved in uh, football and basketball as a young kid. What what drew you to those sports, and, and why did you eventually decide to choose football over basketball? Um, what drew me to the sports? Um, I really was just, you know, being a kid, having fun, um, and – uh, my one of my friends um, played football like he actually played organized football and you know he got me into it and so me and my dad had walked up to the practice and um I just was really good at it so I stayed with it and why I choose football or basketball I mean um football really like when I was a freshman it like took off like we didn't we didn't know I was just playing football I didn't know you know all that was gonna come with it. I was just out there having fun, so. Um, yeah. What's your game day ritual like? Do you have any superstitions or routines that you follow to get into the zone before kickoff? Um, I usually, you know, just go by myself um, and just, you know, put my headphones on, and you know, that's really my motto: just put my headphones on, locked in. Yeah. Uh, who are some athletes you admired the most growing up, and, and how do they influence how you approach your game or your life? Um, some people who um, I looked up to was uh, my high school teammate, uh, Jamison Williams. Um, you know, just seeing him, um, how he worked and how he, um, you know, put the team first and um, how he just, you know, went about his day and went about how he operate, um, you know, was a big, you know, influence to me. You know, obviously he went, you know, big and went pro and, um, you know, it's, it was great to um, have him as a role model. You're uh, returning some punts this year. Do you like uh, going back there and, and uh, returning punts? Yeah, I like uh, returning punts. It's, it's definitely a challenge, though. So, yeah, I love it, though. Uh, have you? Uh, do you think you um, uh, getting getting it down as far as a as far as a, a role, or, or is it something that uh, you think you want to do in the future? Uh, definitely, I want to do in the future. Um, like like again, um, like I said earlier. Um, Anything, you know, the team needs me to do to win, you know, I'm down for it. What's something about you that people would be surprised to learn, whether it's a hidden talent or an unusual hobby? I mean, I'm pretty much normal. <laughs> <laughs> I just be chilling. I don't really do much. All so football? Cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, I saw you and uh, your girlfriend, Kendall, you're doing uh, YouTube videos. Uh, I saw you went yeah. out to to Vegas, I think. Was it Vegas uh, for the UFC? Miami. Or Miami. No, that was, was St. Louis. That was St. That Louis. Was St. Louis. Okay, how was that experience being up there in the near the octagon? Oh, uh, it was great. Um, I ain't, I didn't expect you know to have that much fun when I went there. So um, yeah, you know, and I would I would do it again in the future. So it was yeah. a great time. Is there a piece of advice you've received from a coach or a mentor that's really stuck with you and helped you, you know, shape your outlook both as a player and as a person? Um. Yeah. Uh, my old, my little league coach, you know, he always told me, um, if it ain't going your way, make it go your way. So um, yeah. that's how I really operate. You know, if something not going my way, you know, I'm going to make it go my way. So, yeah. You've talked about winning the Heisman Trophy. What do you think has to happen for you to at least get to New York as a Heisman finalist? Mizzou, their last Heisman finalist was, I believe, Chase Daniel back in uh, 2007. He was Heisman finalist? Heisman finalist, yeah. So he was at bare minimum. So he was there when. He, yeah, he was there. He was one of the the people there uh, on stage. Who got picked? That year it was Tim Tebow. Yeah, but um, what I need to do there to get there, um, I feel like I just gotta you know play my game. You know everything to take care of itself. You know if I do my job right, um, you know everything will set itself up. Do you have any uh, Heisman winners that you remember and and? enjoyed watching growing up or that you you look at now and think man that's somebody i'd really like to be like um yeah i, I was watching um Devonte smith his Heisman year you know um just you know trying to figure out um different ways to pick his game you know and you know him like put it in my game so um Devontae smith 
Nice. If you could spend a day with any person, past or present, who would it be and why? Uh, probably my dogs. <laughs> Your dogs? <laughs> what kind of dogs do you have? I got two uh, French Bulldogs. What are their names? Ghost, Hemi, and um, Dream. What are your goals for this season, personal goals, and, of course, your team goals? Well, my personal goals, you know, just I just want to establish, um, you know, I'm the best in the country, you know, not just receiver, just I'm, I'm the best player in the country regardless. And um, team-wise, you know, I want to, you know, win it all, you know. Um, it's time for Missoula to get back right. Well, Luther Burden, you are one of the best players in the country, regardless of position, a great receiver. We appreciate you coming on the official Heisman Trophy podcast, and we wish you the best of luck this season. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's official Heisman Trophy podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to like, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Your support helps us reach more listeners just like you and keeps us motivated to bring you great content each week. Don't forget to follow us on social media for updates, behind-the-scenes content, and more. Any other feedback or questions, just email us at pod at heisman.com. That's pod at heisman.com, or drop me a note on x.com at heismanpundit. You don't need to throw for over 4,000 yards or rush for 2,000 yards to attend the Heisman Gala. That's the annual celebration in New York to honor the Heisman Trophy winner the day after the announcement. Tickets to the gala are open to the public and will go on sale soon. So be sure to keep checking at Heisman.com for information on how to secure your seat and witness Heisman history. This is Archie Griffin, 1974-1975's Heisman Trophy winner, and you're listening to the official Heisman Podcast. And we're heading into the third week of the college football season. We're getting into mid-September. Fall is on its way. And you're going to start hearing the term September Heisman being bandied about in the next week or two. Now, September Heisman is a phrase that I actually came up with back when I ran HeismanPundit.com. Back then, I noticed kind of a pattern where you'd see certain players get a lot of attention early because maybe they feasted on inferior competition or they just got off to a very hot start. And what would inevitably happen is some of these players would get anointed uh, just one month into the season. So at the end of every September, I would award what was called the September Heisman. The concept never implied that the winner of the September Heisman could never actually win the Heisman. It was just merely uh, sort of noting which player had dominated the first month of the season. But as this term has been used more and more over the years, it seems to imply that games in September don't matter. That people who talk about the Heisman in September are getting ahead of their skis. That to promote a player in September is a bit untoward. That somehow the games at the end of the season matter more than the games at the beginning. Which just isn't true. The great thing about college football, well, excuse me, what used to be great about college football is that every regular season game was a life or death matter. Now, that's still the case when it comes to the Heisman Trophy. Every game matters. There are plenty of examples of Heisman Trophies that have been won in September. Shall I name them? Consider the case of Notre Dame's Tim Brown in 1987. You'll be hard-pressed to find any Notre Dame fan who remembers anything else from that season that Tim Brown did other than those two great punt returns he had against Michigan State on September 19, 1987. By all accounts, that's when he won the Heisman. Look at Ty Detmer at BYU in 1990. On September 8th of that season, he had the game of his life against Miami. 406 passing yards to knock off the number one Canes. That's all the voters needed to know that year. Detmer threw for 41 touchdown passes and 28 interceptions that year. None of it mattered because he had beaten number one Miami in September. Now look, it's somewhat true that Heisman voters have short memories. Heck, we all have short memories in this day and age of social media, short attention spans, 24-hour news cycles. So yeah, games at the end have taken on greater significance as we've kind of changed our whole approach to doing college football. Nevertheless, you're going to have a really hard time winning the Heisman Trophy if you have a bad September. It may be really hard to win the Heisman anymore in September, but it's really easy to lose it. And because the Heisman is being dominated by spread quarterbacks who are putting up astounding numbers... 
because these quarterbacks are averaging something like 4,300 yards of total offense every season, because just getting to New York requires having something like 40 total touchdowns these days, because of all this, you need to have a good September, or at least not a disastrous one. But for those schools out there that really want to win a Heisman, if your guy is doing well in September, I think it makes sense to embrace the title of Heisman candidate. If you want your guy to win the Heisman, you've got to try to control the narrative. You cannot depend on others to do it for you. That all said, let's talk about a few games in September coming up that will have an impact on the Heisman race. First, coming up this Saturday, we've got Alabama at Wisconsin. Jalen Milrow, who finished sixth in the Heisman last year, now a two-time guest on the official Heisman Trophy podcast. Very prestigious honor. He's off to a little bit of a modest start this year so far. 399 yards passing, five touchdowns, no interceptions, 81 yards rushing, four touchdowns. Nine total touchdowns, which is pretty awesome for two games. 205.60 passer rating. So very efficient, good production as far as scoring, but will probably need to up his yardage. The game against Wisconsin is his first opportunity to perform against well-regarded competition. He's in his first year with Kalen DeBoer's system, and you got to think that as he gets more comfortable, the yards and numbers are going to start to improve. And kickoff is at noon Eastern time, so there's going to be a lot of sober eyeballs watching that one. The following Saturday, September 21st, current number 11 USC takes on Michigan in the big house. And this one is worth watching because of Miller Moss. The former teammate of Jackson Dart is off to a great start in his first season as a starter for the Trojans. And, you know, you really can't count out a Lincoln Riley quarterback. At this point, there's a lot of upside and growth for Moss available in the Heisman race. Because if he has a big game and USC beats Michigan in Ann Arbor, then he will have firmly established himself as a legitimate Heisman candidate. Because playing in that system, you know he's going to get numbers, and playing in that conference and for that team, you know he's going to have marquee matchups. So for Miller Moss, it's all opportunity to be captured. Later on the 21st, you have Tennessee at Oklahoma. Very exotic matchup. Nico Iamaliava of Tennessee might be the it quarterback right now. Even Lee Corso thinks he might compete for two Heismans. Which, you know, it's probably a little premature, but whatever. The overall point is that he's a very talented player who's playing in a very efficient offensive system. So he's going to put up big numbers, and if he can put up big numbers against a name brand like Oklahoma, then he might be on his way to being a major Heisman candidate this season. So keep an eye on that one, which kicks off at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time in Norman. And then finally, Saturday, September 28th, promises to be the first big weekend of the college football season. We've got Ohio State at Michigan State, Mississippi State at Texas, Oklahoma State at Kansas State, Louisville and Notre Dame, and then of course the big matchup of the day, Georgia versus Alabama in Bryant-Denny, and I think you're going to see the winner of that game, be it Carson Beck or Jalen Milrow, leave September as the Heisman favorite. So all in all, a bunch of huge games to follow in September that are pertinent to the Heisman race. I hope everyone pays close attention because there's a decent chance that the Heisman field will for all intents and purposes, start to narrow after the first month of the season. And that'll do it for this week's episode. A little bit shorter episode than usual, but I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, if you do enjoy the Heisman Trophy podcast, please like, subscribe, review, follow on all the various streaming platforms. Look at us on TikTok, on YouTube, Instagram, X, any of those platforms, we're there. Special shout outs to the SID staffs at Mississippi and Mizzou. We appreciate you and look forward to working with you in the future. I hope everyone enjoys their week and enjoys the coming weekend of college football. The official Heisman Trophy podcast streams every Wednesday during the college football season and is hosted, co-produced, edited, and engineered by Chris Houston. Paul Goldberg is the executive producer and editor. Special shout out to Isaac Lohenkron and big thanks to the Heisman Trophy Trust and its executive director, Rob Whalen and associate director, Tim Henning. The official Heisman Trophy podcast can be found on Spotify, Apple Music, and anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. You can also find clips of our show on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Just go to at Heisman Trophy.